Welcome to Tesla, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so uh, welcome everybody uh, to my uh, to my video. Appreciate you guys stopping by. Uh, I say Magandang Umaga, Magandang Hapon, a King Maga Kaibagan, or Ma Ayong Buntag, or Ma Ayong Hapon, uh, a Kong Maga Higala. If you speak Cebuano, got Tagalog and Cebuano covered. Uh, I appreciate you guys coming by. Uh, and I, I took another game from the 2012 uh, Philippines Grand Final. Um, you know, I had another video that did pretty good. Uh, so I figured I'd revisit, um, you know, some uh, Julio Cisadora versus the Rogelio Antoni Antonio Jr., also known as GM Joey on chess.com. All right, cool. So if you guys are ready, let's take a look. All right, cool. So we got C4. E6, so we start off with like an English, uh, you know, C4 being English, of course. Uh, this was the famous uh, first move of, uh, you know, Bobby Fischer in the 1972 World Championship uh, match against Boris Spassky. Uh, this was something that kind of threw Boris Spassky off a little bit because, you know, um, uh, Bobby Fischer only played this very rarely. Uh, it's not really too much recorded that he played it ever, so um, it was a definite surprise. Anyway, we got E6. We got G3. Uh, knight to f6, bishop to g2, we have d5, we have knight to f3. And so we have uh, now the English Neo-Catalan. Uh, kind of like a, uh, you know, you guys that are familiar with playing uh, d4, uh, oops, playing d4, um, this is a very, uh, this is a very uh, Catalan-like structure. Uh, so, you know, just basically just missing d4. Uh, so if you had uh, maybe a bishop to e7 and a d4, it would pretty much transpose into a Catalan situation. Uh, so... We have d4 uh, and we have b4 and b4 is actually the novelty of the game. Um, as of 2012, um, it had never been seen before. This is the first time it had been played. Um, but as of today, uh, it's been played 42 different times. Um, so it's definitely something that's been picked up. Um, it is a little it is a little dubious for white. I'm, I'm going to have to be honest with you. Um, it is not uh, it is not the strongest. Uh, you know, it's, it's not it's not considered sound. Um, so it just kind of comes down to like, you know, how good you are playing the theory uh, of it. Um, if you can kind of get into some trouble as black. But also at this point in the game, if you want to go ahead and pause the video uh, and see what uh, see what the best possible move is for black here, uh, go ahead and do so. All right, cool. So I think a lot of you guys are questioning if taking this pawn is dangerous. Uh, because I think that a lot of you guys probably would be seeing bishop takes and then queen to a4. Let's not do that. Bishop takes and then queen to a4. Uh, and it kind of seems like after knight comes here to defend the bishop, uh, you'll see a knight to e5 come. And that is all true. So if you if you calculated that far, um, that is good. Uh, but that is very true that that is the situation. So, but... B4, bishop takes B4 is actually the best move in the position. And I'll, and I'll be able to show you why. It takes a little bit of calculation on the, on the part of white. So uh, after, uh, not that. So after bishop takes B4, you do see queen to A4. And then you see knight to C6. You see knight to E5. But then you have the very, very key move, rook to B8. Uh, and rook to B8 is the, is the key move uh, because you have to be able to defend this bishop once this knight is snapped off the board. Um, so that's the, very, that, that's the importance of rook to B8. Uh, but after we see some more moves, like the knight would take on c6, pawn takes c6, bishop takes c6, bishop to d7, bishop takes d7, queen takes d7, queen also takes d7. Uh, we have knight takes d7 and knight to a3. And um, as you can see, uh, you know, it's a pretty good advantage for, uh, for, for black. Uh, and it's mostly because of the uh, underdevelopment uh, of white. You know, white is not castled. Uh, they still have an issue kind of with their bishop. Uh, you know, they need to get their uh, their rooks connected. So they're a little bit behind. So it's not that uh, material wise you're behind. Um, you know, you're not down any material, but you are very, very behind uh, as far as the uh, the opening is concerned. Um, so you do have to kind of get, uh, you know, get get to moving um, and, you know, castling or maybe even moving king to e7 is possible and stuff like that. So after b4, uh, Rogelio just decides he's like, hey, I don't want any of that. Uh, you know, maybe he didn't feel like calculating or he just was thinking it was maybe a little too risky. So he went ahead and went, uh, a five. And so we see B five, uh, we see Bishop to C five. We got Bishop to B two. Uh, we have Queen to D six. So both players just getting their development out. Uh, we have E three. 
uh, pawn takes uh, e5, or <laughs> pawn to e5, my bad. Uh, and we have pawn takes d4, uh, pawn takes d4, uh, and then we have castles for white, castles for black, and then we have d3. Um, and so you see white is doing pretty good um, here. Uh, they just need to, you know, get their knight developed. Uh, you know, they're not going to go that way. Uh, so bishop, uh, knight to d2, knight b to d2 seems like the most logical. Uh, so after we see a4, uh, we see rook to e1. Uh, we got c6, uh, knight b to d2. Uh, we have h6. Uh, and what I will say about black in this particular situation is they are kind of making quite a bit of pawn moves. Um, you know, h6, uh, there's not really a threat of knight to g5. Um, you know, knight to g5 doesn't really thoroughly threaten anything. So h6 is kind of just too cautious. Um, you know, and you don't really need to create loot for your king right now um, because, you know, you're not really risking back rank stuff. Um, so I just think that in this particular situation, uh, there's just a little, a slightly too many pawn moves that have been made by black. Uh, so it's not putting them in like a, a severe deficit, but, uh, you know, they have to get their pieces developed. And you'll see this come up in a minute here. So the knight comes to e4. Uh, we have knight takes e4, rook takes e4, uh, and then we have f5. And there's another pawn move we have. And uh, there's actually a really interesting <laughs> move. So what was played in the game was actually rook to f4. But there was actually a really interesting move. Um, it's very counterintuitive because this is something you just naturally figure that you're going to do. Um, and it's actually to give the exchange up right here. Um, so the computer figured that rook takes d4 is the best possible continuation. Uh, and I'll be able to, after a couple of moves, show you exactly why I think the computer feels that way. So the rook takes on d4, the bishop takes on d4, knight takes on d4. Uh, we have knight to d7. We have queen to e2. Knight to f6, pawn takes c6, pawn takes c6, and then we have bishop takes c6. Now, the reason, like I'm saying before, that I'm thinking that the computer is giving such a strong evaluation for, for, for black is because you have, so the first thing you have to look at is you have the bishop here, uh, and it is a very open position um, that you are presented with. So you have a lot of strength in the bishop here, um, and you are also up two pawns. So, you know, you're figuring when you're doing the math, you're thinking, okay, the rook, you know, the rook is worth more than that and stuff like that. But, you know, you have to take more into consideration than just, you know, what is uh, physically on the board and the percentages of each move, the, the percentages of, you know, the, the values of each piece. Uh, because sometimes a rook can be stronger than a queen. Uh, sometimes a minor piece can be stronger than a rook or a queen itself. Like, it just really depends on if you're, like, closer or closer to, you know, um, the uh, checkmate, you know, and that's the ultimate goal. So, you know, like I said, I mean, you have six pawns to four. Uh, and you also have very active bishops. Uh, and so the king is kind of a little bit open. Um, so I think, and then plus, you know, the development for black is not all the way complete. So, you know, I think in, in that in that respect, you know, you're having a little bit of, a, you know, an advantage here for, for uh, white. So we did see rook to f4. And so we see a3. Uh, bishop takes d4. Uh, g5. We see bishop takes c5, queen takes c5, we see rook to d4. And as you can kind of see, comparing to what we saw a second ago, you know, white, black started kind of pushing white around a little bit when you didn't sacrifice the rook. But like I said, I mean, there aren't many players uh, that are just going to just give away an exchange um, because it just kind of seems like you're just giving away too much power. And so uh, we see g4, and after rook to f4, uh, <laughs> you actually give up the, the knight. So that's something that, you know, probably would have been better to go into the rook takes there. So queen takes f3. We got queen to e7. We have d4. Uh, we have rook to a4. So we have rook to h4. Rook to f6. We got queen to c3. You know, hoping we can possibly get something in like, you know, pushing the pawn and then checking the king here. Uh, but uh, we see queen to b4. We're not allowing that to happen. Uh, so we see queen to e3, rook to e6, and queen to f4. And this is a very interesting move because something I mentioned before is that black is underdeveloped. You know, they're moving uh, these other pieces before they've moved. So as you notice, they haven't moved their knight or their bishop at all. So uh, this is definitely something you want to be paying attention to. And I'm always talking about, like, you know, noticing any undefended piece in your opponent's position and seeing if there's a way you can try to exploit it. So uh, queen to f4. Um, is doing a really good job of kind of picking at Black's, uh, you know, Black's possible weaknesses. Um, but it's actually pretty easy to defend this weakness. In this case, it's queen to d6. Uh, and then when we see d5 in the position, and so we see queen takes f4, rook takes f4, we got rook to f6, uh, we got pawn takes c6, pawn takes c6, and we have rook to d1. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to throw a little, uh, little attack here. It's, it's all like, you know, building on the fact that this bishop and this knight have not moved the entire game. 
uh, we're on move 30. So you definitely don't want to be there. Uh, so pawn takes b5, uh, rook to d8 with check. We have rook to f8, rook down to d6. And so like as you just see, I mean, you know, uh, white is continuing to attack any little weakness that black has. Um, so when you can produce threats on your opponent, uh, you know, they're they're usually forced, uh, you know, to uh, respond to those threats. So it makes the calculation on your part a lot easier. Uh, so we got king to D g7. We have pawn takes b5. We got uh, rook takes f4. Uh, pawn, uh, pawn takes f4. Uh, we have rook to f7. We got b6. We got bishop to b7. Uh, we have rook uh, bishop to f1. We got rook to d7. And uh, as you notice in these moves, rook to e6, white is avoiding trades. Um, something that you have to understand is like whenever you are down material, you do not want to trade. Um, you know, there are very few cases that you want to trade, but in general, you don't want to trade because then that just makes it much easier for your opponent because you're literally going to run out of pieces if you trade down. So, of course, if this bishop and this rook are taken off the board, then your opponent has a knight and you have nothing. So you definitely don't want to go into that. But um, so we see bishop to d5, rook comes to e3. We got a uh, Rook to b7, rook takes a3, rook takes b6. We got rook to a5, uh, bishop to e6, we got a4. Uh, trying to see if we can get something rolling with this pass pawn over here. And so we see king to f6, we see rook to b5 because um, this is actually somewhat of a beneficial trade because you know even though you are down the piece, you do want to kind of get this rook off the board because it is very, very strong in an open position. So um, this is actually a legitimate trade in this case. So the rook takes b5, bishop takes b5. Um, you want to maintain this pawn on this uh, this file uh, because you have the ability to possibly push it uh, and knock this knight out the way. This knight isn't in the best defensive position for you know to be able to defend against the pawn promoting. So the bishop comes to d5, and after we see a5, bishop to b7, uh, now we have made it impossible to push this pawn further. Um, so it's making it's making you know White's game pretty pretty tough here. So we see King to F1, we got King to E6, King to E2, King to D5, we got King to E3, we got Bishop to A6, uh, and uh, this is a uh, this is pretty much forcing a trade because I mean the only thing you can really do is move the Bishop back over here. But as as you can see, I mean there there isn't a target here, and this Bishop you know this Bishop is light squared as well. Uh, so it has the perfect ability to protect this light squared pawn, even though it's stuck on a light square. Uh, so we, you know, we end up having to trade. So bishop takes a6, knight takes a6, we got king to f3. Uh, we're trying to see if we can kind of work our way around. If we can get rid of this pawn, we have somewhat of a chance uh, because we do have a, another pass pawn on this side of the board. And as you guys um, are familiar with some of you, um, you know, a knight has a little bit of a hard time trying to defend pawns on, on different sides of the board. Uh, bishops are much better for that in endgame. So uh, we have a uh, knight to c7. We got king to g3. Knight to e6. We got king to h4. And then we have the knight perfectly in time uh, to make sure that we don't have any more king moves. Because as you guys can see, you can't go here and you also can't go here. So the knight did a good job of coming back over. And something I want to, something I'll put a card on, a uh, card about in the upper right hand corner. Um, is uh, this king. So if we draw like the square of this particular pawn, the king is sitting inside that square right now. Um, so, you know, or, you know, some people, they do it like this. They do it like a little diagonal thing and kind of do it like that. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, it's visually, it ends up being the same thing once you're familiar with the concept. But, you know, we don't want to step this king any further this way uh, because it is going to step outside the square. And then this this pawn can just literally promote promote on its own. Um, so, you know, black is being very careful to make sure he does not do that. So the king comes down to g3. We see king to c5, king to f3. We got king to b5. Uh, we got king to e3. We have knight to e6. Um, as you can see, black is trying to make sure that they restrict uh, the king uh, from really making movement. So before we saw that he couldn't go to these two squares. Now he can't really go anywhere now because uh, this pawn is going to drop. So, you know, you're really restricting the king to these two squares. So the king comes to d3, uh, king takes on a5, uh, we see king to c4, knight takes f4, uh, king to d4, we got king to g6, uh, we got king to d5, we got b5, you know, getting that king back into play. Uh, king comes to e6, knight to h4, uh, we have king to f6, king comes to c5, we have king to g7, we have king to d5, king takes h6, king to e4, we have king down to h5, knight to f3. We have h3, we have king to f4, king to g6, uh, king to e5 with check, 
King comes to f6, we see King to d3, we see f3, and then we see Knight to e5. Um, it is an, actually in this position uh, that Julio Sedora does resign the game. Uh, and I just chose kind of like a little simple uh, reason as to why he would have done that. Um, you know, basically, there's just not a possibility. The most important thing in the position is this pawn here. Um, you know, you have the ability of sacrificing the knight if you have to, um, because, uh, you know, you're going to be getting this pawn and uh, you're going to be able to start pushing this pawn forward. So, you know, basically, if you had a situation like this, um, this is just a sample variation. H4, knight takes on F3. We have H5 trying to get that pawn to promote. We see knight to G5. Uh, h6 king comes to g4 and black uh, white is actually in zoo zone here um you know they can't go uh they they can't go back this way um because they're going to be abandoning this pawn and it's just free to run down the board um but i mean even if you did have it like i said uh, king comes to g7 we start doing that you're pushing you know you can always give up the knight uh and you're just going to be pushing this one home uh, and there's just nothing stopping it. So that was that game. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting, the end game that they got into. Um, you know, games get pretty complicated, you know, when you're getting into end games uh, because it's when you when you are in an end game, um, literally defeat can be like just one move away. You know, and that's those are the things that are really interesting about end games. It's like each little different square you can go to you know, makes the uh, makes the, the, the game either a win, loss, or a draw in some cases. So it's, it's important to know the end games. But Miraming Salamat, Salamat, Po, Akeem Magai Kaibagan. Uh, appreciate you guys coming by, stopping by. Uh, Mabu, hi to you. Ingat Lagi. Uh, and uh, I almost out tie y'all to you guys. It's like 2 o'clock in the It's like, I think it's 1 o'clock in the morning over there. So you guys aren't really up yet. Uh, so hopefully when you guys get up, you start watching my video. Uh, but I appreciate you guys very much. And I'll see you guys next time. All right.